Good evening, and welcome to tonight's meeting of the Commonwealth Club of California, the place where you are in the know. I'm Diana reyes Ballman, Manager of Corporate Affairs for Chevron Corporation, and your chair for the program. You can find the Commonwealth Club on the internet at commonwealth.org. Tonight's program is another in our Innovating California series a partnership between the club and Chevron to foster dialogue about solutions to some of the most critical issues facing California. Our focus today is Education Beyond Talk, a look at innovative new methods of teaching and the amazing impact of experiential learning. It's no secret that California and the nation continue to fight an uphill battle to stay educationally competitive. A recent study showed that American students rank 25th among 34 countries in math and science, behind China, South Korea, Hong Kong, and Finland. And California ranked below average in the US. What are the solutions for getting us back on track? How can students develop the critical thinking and communication skills necessary for post-secondary success and citizenship in a world fueled by innovations in science and technology. Our panel of educational experts say that the answer lies in real-world problem solving, what's termed as experiential education. You're going to hear about innovative work that could well hold the key to turning around the educational system and America's future. Our prominent panel includes the founder of an organization with more than 250,000 donors who've given over $30 million to support 60,000 classroom projects, and the CEO of a leading provider of rigorous and innovative science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, or STEM, education curricular programs used in middle and high schools across the US and a noted physicist who chairs the National Board on Science Education. To begin the discussion and to introduce our panel, it is now my pleasure to welcome our distinguished moderator. Dr. Dennis Bartels, Executive Director of San Francisco's Exploratorium, and since 2009, a member of the Education Working Group for the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology. Dr. Bertels is an internationally known science education and policy expert who has served as executive director of the Exploratorium since 2006. The Exploratorium has been recognized as the global leader in now what is known as informal learning. As a model for inquiry-based self-directed learning, it has spawned hundreds of participatory science centers around the world. Its professional development program for educators has impacted more than 450,000 primary and secondary teachers. Dr. Patels holds a PhD in education administration and policy analysis from Stanford University. He has served on numerous committees and advisory boards for the National Science Foundation and has also testified before committees on both houses of Congress concerning K through 12 science and math education. I'm pleased to turn the program over to Dr. Dennis Bartel. Thank you, Diana. Um, and thank you, Chevron, for your sincere and, and deep interest uh, in STEM education uh, for all, each and every child, uh, not just in California, but actually across the whole country. It's, it's my pleasure to be the moderator of this panel. and. Experiential learning um, is a topic that is very near and dear to my own heart. Uh, and so it's an honor for me to be here today and to introduce this uh, incredibly distinguished panel. Uh, and personally, I might add all uh, individuals and organizations that I deeply admire. Um, so it, it really is an honor for me. Um, I'd like to first introduce right next to me, Charles Best, uh, who is the founder of DonorsChoose.com, a site that lets people fund classroom projects that are actually proposed uh, by teachers. Uh, it was a brilliant idea that has really caught fire, as uh, Diana was mentioning. The site has more than 250,000 donors who've given over $30 million. Um, and Mr. Best himself started as a classroom teacher when he had the idea. He founded the site in 2000 while teaching at Wings Academy, a public high school in the Bronx. In 2003, Newsweek wrote about the site, and it later became one of Oprah Winfrey's favorite things. <laughs> 
Today, donors choose both celebrity board members, uh, including Stephen Colbert, uh, who has called it revolutionary. Uh, congratulations on that as well. <laughs> uh, and next to him is Dr. Vince uh, Bertram, president and CEO of Project Lead the Way, which is recognized as the leading provider of innovative uh, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics education curricular programs used in the middle and high school uh, schools across the country. These programs engage students in projects and problem-based learning, providing hands-on classroom experiences. Students create, design, build, and solve problems while applying what they have learned in math and science. Prior to joining Project Lead the Way, uh, Dr. Bertram was the superintendent who led Indiana's third largest urban school district to unprecedented improvements in student achievement, community collaboration, and operational efficiency. He has earned his doctorate, specialist and master and bachelor degrees, all from Ball State University, and a master's degree in educational policy and management from Harvard University. Um, so welcome, Vince. Thank you. Uh, and then next to uh, Vince is Dr. Helen Quinn, uh, a, a woman I've had the pleasure of working with on, on a number of uh, programs and projects uh, here locally. She is a professor emeritus of physics at the Stanford Linear Accelerator Center, where she chaired the Department of Particle Physics and Astrophysics. She is internationally recognized as a theoretical physicist and an elected member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. She served as the president of the American Physical Society in 2004. In addition to her scholarship in physics, Dr. Quinn has had a long-term involvement in science education and in the continuing education of science teachers, of which she really has dedicated um, just thousands of hours of her personal time. She is chair of the National Academy Board's uh, uh, science education uh, panel that is creating a new framework for science education standards, um, commonly known as next generation science standards uh, for the nation that is expected to have a national impact on the next generation of science standards and curricula. Uh, and in fact, uh, California has selected itself to be one of the pilot states to create new curriculum standards for students in California based on this national framework. Dr. Quinn holds a bachelor's degree and PhD from Stanford University. So please welcome all of our panelists. So I want to start with sort of a broad question before we dive into experiential learning per se. Um, and it's a question that honestly has puzzled me, uh, and I've thought long and hard, and I'm really curious about your own opinions on it. Uh, and it's this. You know, we cited the statistics about how our students are doing in school on these standardized tests, and many of you have heard um, the crying need to reform our STEM education programs. Um, but at the same time, we exist in California, and in particular in a region, Silicon Valley, that's known for its innovation, for its creativity, for its entrepreneurship, uh, for its unconventional thinking uh, and, and independent thought. Um, and uh, those two things don't quite seem to follow together. Uh, but it seems to me that experiential learning, um, you know, the things that you do, for instance, uh, Vince, with engineering and tinkering and the maker movement, uh, or Helen, uh, you know, the work that you've done on the national panel to really emphasize, for instance, investigation and practices of scientists as part of the student curriculum, or Charles, you know, providing the students with, uh, or the teachers with the materials they need to do hands-on activities. You know, is there a connection here between all these things, or, or what do you think? How do you how do you resolve that contra seeming contradiction? Well, I could give a, a specific example of all these dots connecting. Uh, we see DonorsChoose.org not as a, a prescription, but as a platform, a platform that a quarter million teachers at half of all the public schools in America are using to create classroom project requests that represent the, the materials that their students most need, the activities that will best bring the subject matter to life. And it's a platform where citizen philanthropists, companies, foundations find and support classroom projects that match their passion or their criteria. 100,000 of the projects funded on our site were math and science projects. California is overrepresented amongst those projects. And I think, for, for me, that might capture both the need. Uh, it, it shouldn't be that California is overrepresented within DonorsChoose.org if you believe that what's driving them is the lack of funding. But I think the good news is that I, I think what's also driving them is the culture of innovation in this state. There are 2,000 projects alive on the site right now from California math and science teachers. I took a look at one project, and it was uh, from a Project Lead the Way teacher. 
Uh, his name is uh, Juan Vasquez Ani, and he's uh, requesting a digital microscope. And uh, it was actually uh, funded by Chevron. And I would not be surprised uh, if this teacher, Juan Vasquez Ani, was applying National Science Foundation standards in his request for a digital microscope, which was funded by Chevron. And of course, if you stuck around on our site, you'd also see uh, projects that center on field trips to the Exploratorium. <laughs> <laughs> very well done, <laughs> Charles, very I, well. <laughs> I think we also need to be careful when we look at test data. Tests measure something, but they don't measure everything. And in fact, when you look at the countries that score well on international comparisons in science scores and ask about student interest in science, you find a decreasing student interest with increasing scoring on these particular measures. Wow. So something is going on, but it isn't always getting engaged in science. And that takes doing science. You can learn a lot of facts and remember them and score well on the test and become very good at that and have no ability at all to do science, to think like a scientist, to begin to answer questions for yourself, to apply your knowledge in new contexts. All of those things are what we need both entrepreneurs and indeed employees in many, many jobs today to be able to do. And those things don't come from learning a list of facts. So being careful about what's being measured and paying attention to more than just the scores. The scores are important and the kids do need to learn some facts but they'll learn them better and retain them longer if they learn them in the context of doing science and not just being told this is what scientists have discovered. And that's what our framework and what I think the next generation science standards will be pushing. We say science has three dimensions. One of those dimensions, which we call the third dimension, is indeed the core knowledge that students need about important ideas across the disciplines of science. The other two are the connective tissue, which make it science. Those are, first of all, science practices, doing science, science and engineering practices, because applying your knowledge in a, in a design challenge is also a way to learn to understand the science more deeply. And the second one is a set of cross-cutting ideas like the idea that scientists are trying to understand cause and effect, mechanisms for cause and effect in a system, and that that's a question that is the same question an ecologist is as asking or a particle physicist is asking, and understanding those common questions, those common ideas, which are tools for thinking across all of science is also very important. I'll stop there and let others <laughs> chime in. Great. That was great. You know, Howard Gardner once quipped that the greatest deficit in American students is content coverage and the greatest threat. And that in America, we teach a mile wide and an inch deep. And the whole idea is that we have to get through the book. And it's about content coverage. And as Dr. Quinn mentioned, it's, it's what we can push out in terms of information so that students can regurgitate the information on a test and perform. But then can they do? And I remember back in 2001, I was just appointed as principal of a large urban high school, 2,400 students. 25% of our kids were dropping out of school. Another 25%, conservatively, were graduating with a diploma that was almost meaningless to them because they didn't have the skills to be successful when they graduated from high school. So I approached my superintendent. His instructions for me were really simple. He called me in one day after a month on the job. He said, your job is to fix it. <laughs> well, we actually were introduced to Project Way in 2001. And I started talking about project-based learning and activity-based learning and how we can encourage students to think differently, creatively, critically about problem solving. And my superintendent asked, what is this thing about project-based learning? And I gave him an example. And it was really not a project-based example. But I said, I said here, are, here are a group of students. 
and I, I gave them a list of our top 50 students. And I said, if we were to give them a book on how to make a birdhouse, and we asked them to study the book, and at the end, we give them a test. How many of these students could pass the test? And he said, all of them. I said, yes, but not a single one can make a birdhouse. Yeah. They don't know how to apply the knowledge that they've gained. And it's that knowledge that allows them to think deeper and to learn at a different level. It's that critical thinking that we, we believe that is so important for our students. And that's really what we do in Project Lead the Way, is we give students real problems. We, we make learning relevant. And not only do they start to understand how to do this stuff, but they understand the relevancy of other disciplines. They understand the importance of mathematics, the importance of science. And one of the key findings over the last 15 years in Project Lead the Way, early on there were, there were belief that Project with the Way as an elective course would somehow move kids away from advanced math and science. We're finding just the opposite. Our students understand that math is important, science is important, and they're taking more math and advanced math and science courses. So that's really important. I think those are the type of things that we need to continue to push. And there are extraordinary pressures on teachers in schools and school districts to perform on exams. And when that happens, we actually, Intuitively, we start to push unloading information and asking kids to recite things. And we think that in a project-based classroom, it actually takes away from time of getting information. But the opposite is true. Vince, actually, that uh, is a nice sort of segue into this next question I wanted to get into, because we, we talk about experiential learning or hands-on learning or learning by doing. And it's sort of a term of art that just begs a little more precise definition. Um, uh, and in particular, uh, you know, there's been criticisms out there that not all hands-on is equal. Um, this notion that, in fact, sometimes you see hands-on, but the mind isn't engaged. It's hands-on, but not minds-on. Um, so could you guys help us understand better what you mean by experiential learning um, by sort of helping us to define it with some examples? And also, could you help us understand, you know, what do people mean when it's, it's both hands-on and minds-on? Well, at Donors Choose Daughter, we, we try and channel the voices of teachers because we think that dedicated classroom teachers know their kids better than anybody else in the system. And if we can tap into their pent up frontline expertise, we might unleash uh, the smartest, best targeted, most innovative micro solutions that, that are possible. And a, a couple years ago, I started noticing anecdotally that there were a lot of middle school math teachers requesting cooking equipment on our site. And I couldn't understand quite why, but I, I dug into these projects and what was clear was that teachers on the front lines, middle school math teachers specifically, have concluded that doing recipes is one of the best ways to get reluctant learners hooked on math. Because when you're um, putting together the ingredients, you're working with fractions. When you uh, double the ingredients, you get double the outcome. When you eat the outcome, you've got a sensory experience associated with, with fundamental math and you've got a kid who can touch and feel math. I was checking out uh, some of the math and science projects on our site before uh, joining you tonight, and um, one teacher quoted a, 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 a saying that um, uh, I, I hear and I forget, I see and I remember, I do and I understand. There the, the teacher was quoting someone else, and I think that was a pretty uh, good way to capture experiential learning. I saw another teacher's project who was not quoting uh, from anybody, but her project was entitled, The Way to a Kid's Brain is Through Their Hands. And I thought that that was a really neat way to capture experiential learning in the words of one of our teachers. And it's why um, we see hands-on resources, resources that are necessary to take the subject matter out of a book and put it into the hands of students. Those are the resources that teachers most often request on our site. You'll see very few textbooks being requested at <laughs> donorschoose.org. Uh, you will see a, a lot of requests for The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks, um, which ranks almost as high as The Hunger Games and as Diary of a Wimpy Kid, uh, amongst the most popularly requested books on our site. Um, and you'll even actually see Rebecca Sklute, the author, uh, funding a number of those requests for uh, The Immortal Life of Henrietta Lacks. 
Uh, you'll see the, the, the teacher who I quoted was requesting um, a bat, so, thankfully a, 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 a bat to uh, dissect, not, not a live bat, so students could learn about nocturnal activity. Speaking of, um, of animals to dissect, we were put on PETA's target list because there were so many teachers requesting uh, um, uh, <laughs> dissection resources on our site. Um, and and I'll, I'll close, speaking of um, uh, organisms, we had one of our more memorable experiences when a teacher who had requested butterfly cocoons on our site got funding, and the vendor failed to ship directly to the teacher's classroom. They shipped <laughs> to our office. Um, and uh, my colleagues and I will never forget when there were hatched butterflies flying all around uh, our <laughs> office. That's when the hands-on requests that teachers are putting up on DonorsChoose.org uh, really came home, literally. <laughs> thank, thank you, Charles. But you know, there's still I, this thing about play. And I remember when we had a lot of materials in classrooms when I was a kid, we didn't always do exactly what those materials, what the teacher wanted us to do. I mean, how do we sort of distinguish when, when is play actually really engaging and, and productive? And, and I know a lot of people have a hard time walking into a classroom and sort of figuring out, is there any learning going on here? Isn't it pretty cool when we blur those lines? There's a space for both, right? Yeah, there's a space for a time where the lines are blurred, and there's space for a time where there's a lot of focus. And this is the part that comes after the doing. There's, if we look at our science practices, we say, yes, investigating, designing experiments, but interpreting data, arguing from evidence, developing explanation of phenomena, that's an intellectual play. And that's a game where the kids have to get together and talk through what they've done and what they've understood right. from it. And what, so there's, there's part of both. There's plenty of room for messing around and trying to figure things out. And then there's a coming together and having some structured discussion where the aim of everybody in the room is to get to a common understanding. Yeah. That's what scientists do, after all. And that's what we need children to do in order that they, first of all, learn the ideas, because you really don't learn just by being told. And secondly, so that they understand what science is. And that's part of what they need to learn in the science classroom, that there's a methodology for exploring the world around you that actually works. Vince? Well, well and there's tremendous value in learning that that's not the way it works. Right. Not and always. <laughs> it, yes, in experimenting and having a, a risk-free environment to do that. To understand, there's a, there's a big difference in teaching students a design process and allowing them experience it. Right. You know, or programming robots, building robots. You know, doing those type of things are, are critical. My 12-year-old my son captured it recently, and I was on the phone talking to someone about this very issue. He said, Dad, isn't this difference in me playing Madden 13 and me playing football? Yeah, I, I, I can learn how, I might be able to do this on a computer, but can I go play the game? Can I actually go out into the world and, and think differently and create these type of things and apply learning in, in a fundamental way? I think all that's, that's very important. But I think what we find is the, the depth of learning and what happens when students are actually engaged in that type of, of experiential type of experience. Yeah. And as you pointed out, the finding out that something doesn't work the first time you build it and recognizing that that's not a problem Right, because you can redesign, you can try again. The notion that you have to be right the first time versus the notion that you learn by failing and learn by trying again is very important learning. Yeah, yeah. in and an both, environment. You both actually make really great points, and I want to explore this one a little bit more. I mean, Frank Oppenheimer, the founder of the Exploratorium, famously said, nobody flunks museum. Um, and, and, this, and you see things like in the maker movement and other things uh, where people get to design their own things that there's this wonderful uh, learning that happens through failure. But it seems to me today especially that the room for failure in schools is very, very tiny. Uh, in fact, you have, I would guess, more students very afraid of failure because of the way we set up the system where everything is driven by getting the correct answer. And particularly How girls. There tends to be, girls tend to judge themselves more harshly. We don't know why, but we know just by 
gathering the data at the same level of performance in math in middle school, the girls will say, I'm no good at math. And the boys will say, I'm really good at math. And they're doing the same math at the same level. So being wrong somehow has a high penalty for girls. And it's one of the reasons we don't have many women in the mathematical sciences, engineering, physics, chemistry, all very low percentage women. But this seems so to put our teachers in a horrible, horrible spot. Getting that message to the yeah. girls that yeah. it's okay for them too. But for the, for the teachers, uh, on the one hand, you, you probably instinctively know that there's um, value in failure and great power in some of these learning things. But at the same time, you're covering this huge amount of content and you're judged by what's on those standardized tests at the end. I mean, if, if you were speaking to a teacher right now, what, what would you advise them? How would you help reconcile that? Well, think about how the classroom operates. Take a music classroom. Does anyone expect a student to pick up an instrument and play beautifully the first time? It's constant practice. It's failure after failure until you play beautiful music. And we accept that. We if, you're teaching, if you're teaching students how to play a, a sport, we practice. And we go out into the side and we shoot more free throws until we get it right. But in other courses, we don't do that. And one of the things that we try to do in our teacher training, we've trained now almost 13,000 teachers across the country, is to switch the role of teacher to that of coach and facilitator. And it's a, quite a transition for teachers, but when that happens, there, it, it changes the entire environment of a classroom where students are free to take risks. They know that failure is just part of it, but they get to a better answer. And then we also teach them how to work together. And it's that collaboration that when we put minds together, we can come up with much better results than we can on our own. And we have to get away from the myth of covering topics, right? If just because we've superficially had a paragraph in the book about this subject and they've been told to read it for homework or the teacher has put it up on the board, that doesn't mean they've learned it or understood it at all. And therefore, we think we're covering more when we go quickly over lots and lots of things. This is the mile wide yeah. inch deep. We're not, because actually not very much learning is going on. So going away from that and looking at what research on learning tells us you need to do to change what's going on in somebody's brain means you have to engage and you have to do. And only in that way can you learn. I think the good, the good news is that um, schools like KIPP charter schools are showing that uh, big gains in student test scores, those standardized tests that often feel like they threaten to be rote, uh, can go hand in hand with experiential learning. KIPP, KIPP schools are at once uh, schools that post incredible gains in standardized test scores and are also the school to send your, stu to send your kid in a low-income community if you want them going on field trips. Uh, and, and that's why uh, we see at DonorsChoose.org, the teachers who use our site, who do so overwhelmingly to put in place experiential learning, to go beyond the mandated curriculum, to go outside of the standardized test, are also the teachers who tend to post the greater student test score gains. Yeah. Charles, you actually bring up a great point, which is how do we know experiential learning works? What's our evidence? He said, Charles, you brought up a great point. <laughs> no, I, I, I tell you, we have all kinds of evidence. There have been over three dozen studies done on Project Lead the Way, and almost without exception, there are positive results on science mathematics scores and overall performance. We, we track students beyond high school. We look at them in college, and students, our Project Way students outperform, outpersist their non-PLW peers almost without exception. Universities recruiting our students. University of Minnesota just reported that a third of their freshman class in the College of Engineering are PL2W students. Employers looking for these students because of the skills they have, they want these kids because they do better. And I think there's all kinds of evidence to suggest when students learn to think critically, problem solve, collaborate, that they will do better. And the type of things that employers and universities are expecting of our students. Right, so they do at least as well on the standardized test, sometimes better, 
And they have this other set of skills, which is to take knowledge and apply it in a new context. They're not limited to just what they've been told. Yeah. And that's a huge difference, and there is real evidence of that. Yeah, I, I think a critical turning point for me was reading a study by David Carraher, who some of you may know, who actually did a study of uh, street children in Brazil. Uh, a number of the children were still in school, and a number had dropped out uh, very young ages. And he took a look at sort of upper elementary mathematics skills and tested both sets of children. Um, and it turned out, believe it or not, that the street children outperformed the kids in school in, in basic mathematics skills, uh, which was a very interesting counterintuitive finding. And then what he discovered, of course, is that the street children were basically running their own businesses, some of them licit and some of them illicit. Uh, but in fact, we're using a lot of basic mathematics to run a business um, and in fact would say, well, I don't know any mathematics, but we're actually outperforming the kids in school. And so for me, that was one of those things where in the context of a, a real and meaningful and significant uh, experience, uh, yes, those skills get uh, reinforced uh, to the nth degree. I didn't know that licit was a word. It makes sense that it is. Yeah, right. Like a safe, legal <laughs> yeah. thing. Well, I, I think it's also important just to, to think about what's happening in, in this state. And I know as a, as a national organization, we have over 4,700 schools in all 50 states. But there's something special happening in California. And we often cite many of the examples in everywhere we go. You know, we have seen the growth in Project Away from a handful of schools five or six years ago to over 300 schools today and growing. We're seeing great results. We're seeing the engagement of universities, you know, San Jose State, San Diego State, and others coming together to, to, to engage with schools and to understand the importance of this type of learning and really pushing this forward. And we have no better partner across the United States than Chevron and the work they're doing. The difference in, in, with Chevron and what we see with other, some other partners is that it's not just about funding. It's about deep engagement. It's about really seeking the outcomes that we need for our students to do better. And it's getting out in schools and helping schools understand the value of this type of learning, helping educators understand that we need our kids to do better. Right? And this is not just coming from a, from a policy perspective, it's coming from employers, from universities, from others saying this is really important. So when we talk about driving this type of learning, there's no place that's happening at a higher level than right here. And we're really excited about the work that's happening here and we're gonna, we wanna do everything possible to keep this growing and keep this moving in a positive direction. You know, we are now receiving a great number of audience questions, and so I want to turn to an audience question, and actually, uh, it appears that at least three people touched upon this question, so it's, I think, a really rich one for us to discuss, and that is sort of what is the role of the online world in experiential learning, that you have these blended learning classrooms, uh, digital learning, things like the Khan Academy appear to be taking hold. Um, how do we think about experiential learning and is there a place for online learning or blended learning or flipped classrooms or some of these things now that are coming on as, as technology becomes more and more prevalent in student use? You know, technology is a tool. You can use it well, you can use it badly. And there are opportunities that technology presents for many things. One of them is to reinforce the standard kind of learning which is basically what the Khan Academy does, is, is support students, give them a chance to go back and, and see somebody argue through the, the way to do the problem one more time. There are things that are available through technology, for example, simulations. There are many things where a kid can't do something to see things at the atomic scale or to see things at the solar system scale. But by working with online three-dimensional simulations, they can begin to have a mental model of what's going on at those scales, which supports their understanding and learning of new ideas about structure and function, about how it works, about why the universe is the way it is. All of those questions which can be fascinating, can be supported by learning through working with simulation. So while there's a, a huge place 
for working with real stuff and doing what you can do hands-on, there's only a part of the world you can reach that way. And technology gives you a way to take the interest and attention that you've learned in the real world problem and take it into situations where you don't have the equipment or the space to examine it directly. Yeah. I'll add a point that, that I think illustrates uh, Helen's principle that technology can be a, a double-edged sword. Uh, we have a, a data scientist who joined our team a couple months ago. It's why I know that a lot of teachers are requesting Henrietta Lacks and, and why, I can, um, why I'm really excited to share some of uh, what's trending in teachers' minds. And one of the things he took a look at was uh, the most frequently requested technology devices on our website. And you might think it's a smart board, or you might think it's an iPad, a laptop, a, a stationary computer. It's none of those things. It's a document camera. A document camera enables, it's like a next generation overhead projector. It enables a, a teacher to do something underneath a camera that could be examining a rock or a fossil. It could be, but it could also be simply showing a printout. And whatever the teacher is doing underneath the camera is displayed 20 feet by 30 feet like you're at a drive-in movie theater. That's the freq most frequently requested on our site, uh, most frequently requested device on our site. It's, it's teachers essentially saying to uh, the powers that be that before you spend $500,000 per school providing one laptop per child, uh, before you spend $50,000 per school providing one smart board per classroom, you should spend $5,000 on one document camera per classroom. And today, I was in Sacramento visiting a, a teacher whose hands-on science materials had been funded by Chevron, and I asked him about his document camera and asked him what he did with it. It's why I'm able to cite that uh, showing fossils and rocks example, because he said that's what he did with his document camera. But he said that document cameras in, in the hands of some teachers can exacerbate traditional ways of teaching, uh, because it might not be a rock that you're putting underneath the document camera. It could be just an old school printout. And now uh, showing students pages of books and printouts has, has become easier as, a, as opposed to more difficult. We have to stop seeing technology as a threat. And I, many of us don't. But I remember as a high school principal, some new technology would come out. And I said, well, it's about time for a faculty meeting. And because I'm sure that we're going to have to come up with some policy to ban the technology. <laughs> you know, but it's how do we embrace technology in a way that enhances learning? And the kind of technology students have in their hands today. And that's, that's a, a difficult shift. I had a student ask me recently, we were in a classroom and he had his, he had his iPhone out and he said, you know, what I don't understand is we can't have our iPhones in class, yet our teachers can have it in class. And why can't this be as helpful for us as it is for the teacher in class? And I ask your teacher. But as I reflected, what I what really I thought was the answer was that the teacher was using it in a very different way from a phone to, for students, a source of learning and the way they learn today and their access to information. Technology plays a critical role in all of this. And, and it's also a way for us to solve some big problems and getting this type of learning to our students. So for instance, in our organization, we're really, we're really focused on you know, the blended learning model in ways that we can have both the use of technology and the delivery of technology, as well as other types of hands-on experiences. But also in how, and, and Helen alluded to this, but how we can bring real experiences to our students that they can't see otherwise, or they can't experience. So we're going around now to companies and interviewing engineers, looking at some of their core processes and things they're doing every day and exploration and we're able to take those directly into thousands of classrooms across the country. And that's pretty exciting work for us. So um, it also helps us deal with another issue, and that's access for students. And when we think about the way learning has changed over time, so has the school setting. And we have traditional schools, but now we have all types of school models, including millions of kids homeschooling. So we can use technology to get this kind of experience to our students, get it, getting this experience into rural schools, 
where they may have 50 students in a school. Technology, again, I think is going to be critical. One last piece, and that is learning can't be confined to six and a half hour, 180 days a year. You know, we can use technology to open learning 24-7. You know, we want students, when they leave our school, to continue thinking about what they're doing and working. And once they get engaged, we do, we, do we stop because the bell rings? We had a, I had a recent situation. I had this little seventh grader, and I, he was in New Orleans. And I was in the class with the kids, and I asked, I was asking, do you like this class? And this little seventh grader looked at me and says, I love this class. And he said, really, why do you love it? He said, because it's last period of the day. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, like, I'm like, great. Uh, <laughs> not really sure where this is going. I said, you're going to have to elaborate. He said, because I get to think all day about what I get to do in this class. Right. And then all of a sudden the bell rings and school's over and he has to shut his computer off or put the, the project away. Technology can open this so that student doesn't, the day doesn't end when the school day ends. So I need to mention that we're listening to the Commonwealth Club of California radio program. Today we're discussing innovative approaches to science and math education. Uh, our panelists today are Charles Best, founder of DonorsChoose.org, Dr. Vince uh, Bertram, president and CEO of Project Lead the Way, and Dr. Helen Quinn, uh, Emeriti Professor of Physics at Stanford University and Chair of the National Board on Science Education. And I'm Dennis Bartels, Executive Director of the Exploratorium uh, and your moderator. Uh, and and I'm, I'm one who really appreciates sort of the power of personal narrative. Uh, I mean, in my own narrative, I remember, you know, someone asked me how I got into the career and how I ended up at the Exploratorium like I did. And I actually remember back in fifth grade sitting there in a classroom and just suddenly striking me, gosh, there's got to be a better way to teach than this. Uh, and at that moment forward, and I think maybe all of us have maybe had that experience somewhere along in, in our educational uh, career paths, uh, got very interested in how people really do learn. And we're speaking to some of the, the, the national uh, most prominent proponents of experiential and hands-on learning. And I just want to ask each of you, do you mind just sharing us your personal narrative, sort of what brought you to this moment in time to really be a proponent, such a strong advocate of this? Well, I was a history teacher at a public high school in the Bronx for five years, and during my first year of teaching, I saw my colleagues and I spending a lot of our own money on copy paper and pencils, and then we would talk in the teacher's lunchroom about beyond the textbook projects that we wanted to do with our students, for which we had no funding. And uh, I created this rudimentary site. My mom made dessert for my colleagues. I put the dessert in the teacher's lunchroom and said, all right, whoever eats this dessert has to go to this newly created website and ask for whatever it is you most want for your students. Propose the project that you've always wanted to do with them. Not coincidentally, the, uh, the 11 colleagues of mine who ate my mom's dessert and posted projects on the site were all hands-on. The health teacher was the first to eat the dessert. She wanted to do uh, a pregnancy prevention project which required baby think-it-over dolls, which are life-size, life-weight dolls that cry at three in the morning and need to be fed and show a teenager what it would be like to have a kid. Uh, the art teacher wanted to do a 20 foot by 30 foot quilt with each of her students doing a square and for that she needed fabric and thread and needles. I, I, I don't often share this because it, it requires a couple um, details, but the project that I posted with, my, with the other teacher at the high school who taught history was uh, to bring in a man who had been profiled in the New Yorker. My students had just read uh, the uh, autobiography of Frederick Douglass, and then they had read a profile in The New Yorker about a man named Mokhtar Tayeb, who, ha was, who had escaped from modern-day slavery in Mauritania, and The New Yorker had profiled him. And we thought how amazing it would be if our students could meet Mokhtar Tayeb and talk to him about his experiences and really bring home and bring to the present day the autobiography of Frederick Douglass. And it turned out that he had, after escaping, was living in the Bronx um, and was willing to sacrifice his speaker's fee. And uh, all we needed to do was cover this uh, de minimis transportation cost. So that was the project that we posted. All projects about uh, putting learning in students' hands and, and bringing learning to life. And of course, it's those kinds of projects which you'll find on our website uh, to this day, now that um, uh, teachers at half of all the public schools in the country are, are using our site. I, 
I'm going Thanks. to give two, two answers to this question. I, first, just how I got to this point in education. You know, I, I grew up poor. And my, I remember my dad walked out at us when I was really young. And I almost dropped out of school when I was in a 10th grader. I was bored to death. And I had a, a principal pull me aside, grab me by the shirt, literally, and say to me, you may give up on yourself, but I am not giving up on you. And it was at that point that I made it real clear that I was going to dedicate my life to trying to save kids just like my principal saved me and the teachers who made a difference in my life. And I, I think we share that responsibility as a community. You know, we share this because our kids will not reach their potential right, until we believe in their promise. And it's absolutely critical that we come together to solve this problem. We cannot afford as a nation to have 25% of our kids dropping out of high school, destined for a lifetime of poverty. We know the results. We just can't accept it. And we have to fight like mad to prevent it. Right? The, Indeed. the other piece of this for me is I, I watched all these kids of this large urban high school just dropping out of school. And I was introduced to Project Lead Away, as I mentioned earlier. And I saw what happened when kids got engaged in learning. These were the same kids who were bored, the kids who were dropping out, the, the, the kids that teachers said they couldn't make it. You know, the people, that, you know, the students that people wanted to give up on. All of a sudden, these were the kids doing great work. And then, as the superintendent of schools, I saw, I had a principal come to me, and he wanted to create the Helfrig Park STEM Academy. And I read his plan, and I told him, I said, this is a great marketing plan, but I'm not sure how it's going to change learning in this low-performing school. And he did something pretty spectacular. He took Project Lead the Way, and our Gateway to Technology program, and he connected it to every discipline. Okay. So art was not taught by itself. He connected it to STEM and to Project Lead the Way. They started talking about chemicals and paint and how things were produced, manufactured. He took physical education and tied in things like heart rate and, and using mathematics and tying it directly back to our courses. Two years later, that school was cited as one of the highest growth schools in the state. I just, I've seen its promise. And now we're on a mission to provide even more access to America's students. Helen? I guess for me, it all goes back to third grade. First and second grade, I hated school. Oh. And it was a very structured school, and I think my parents realized it wasn't the right place for me. So third grade, I went to a new school. It was new for me. It was actually new itself. It had 50 acres of bushland and three classrooms. This is in Australia. And uh, we spent a lot of time out in the bush learning about the environment that was there and learning to recognize the very the plants. I felt so strange when I came to the US and I didn't recognize any plants. <laughs> <laughs> Except the eucalyptus trees that came from Australia. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> but somehow the teachers at that school were supportive of students doing and students creating and students finding their own path. And so I suddenly had a very different way of learning. And for me, it worked. And then as I went through my education, I was aware of these two different ways and saw that for many students, the being asked to perform in a certain way, yes, they can do it. And if they're disciplined enough, they can even get good scores that way. But they don't love it. And I want students to love learning. And I think only if students 
get turned on as learners, so they're going to want to go on learning all their life. Will education really have served its purpose for them? And so I think there's no possible way to have that happen if you don't have some part, at least, of the education be something where the kids get to be in control of it for themselves and to really engage in the process of learning as motivated learners. Yeah. So I'm going to, um, thank you, Helen, so much. I'm going to pick up the pace a little bit so we can get a few more audience questions in. And so I'm going to ask you to keep your answers a bit briefer and, and bounce off. But let's see if we can't get three or four terrific questions we have coming in from the audience. And here's one I, I really love. Um, it's basically, well, what about higher education? Um, we know, in fact, when I was on the PCAS committee, that we actually have far more STEM-capable students at the college level than those choosing to go into these disciplines. And it isn't a matter of preparation. They're more than prepared, but they honestly do not want to pursue a career. Uh, they've been turned off at some point in line. And, and I've heard some of the same criticisms really leveled at the higher education system. If I'm a college professor, uh, you know, what about the higher education question and are there resources for me to really bring more experiential types of experiences uh, into play? It's beginning to happen at the higher education level. There are courses, individual courses in many, many institutions and movement in su whole subject areas where the way the introductory level university courses are being taught is changing dramatically because it works, because they find, indeed, one of the problems not only is that students arrive at university not interested in, ma in majoring in the STEM areas, but even the ones who arrive at university wanting to major in the STEM area subject areas give up during the first or second year in remarkably large percentages. Yeah. If we could just keep the students who arrive at university saying they want to major in STEM, we would be doing a whole lot better in terms of producing scientists and engineers. But isn't there an economic question behind this? I mean, it's very profitable for universities to pile 600 people into a lecture hall. This is part of the problem, yes. Is there a solution? <laughs> I think technology is part of the solution doesn't have to be a lecture hall. You have to have some time in, in an experience where you're doing and some time where you're learning the pieces that you can't learn by doing. And that combination is a shifting combination as you go from second grade to an advanced undergraduate course. But you need some of each in both cases. I think there, there are two, two points. First, I think we have to really think about how we train teachers in STEM. And if we want teachers to teach this way in a project-based environment, then we have to teach them how to do so. I think that's a critical piece. So we're really working with a number of universities now in pre-service training for teachers in, in, in this model. But the other piece is, I believe we have made a mistake in this country by placing such an emphasis on four-year degrees for all students. And a lot of state accountability systems have been aligned to move and to incentivize that type of alignment for students. But there are all kinds of STEM-related careers that don't require a four-year degree. A social degree, apprenticeship programs, certification programs. We have to provide all those options for our students, and I think we'll get more. If we expect all students to go into engineering, they're not going to or into any particular field. We, there are so many opportunities for students, but we have to make the incentive structure and align it with the type of outcomes we expect and want to see from our students. Yeah. Uh, speaking of teachers, uh, we have, uh, I think, uh, the teacher's voice very evident in the questions that we have coming forward, and they keep coming back to an issue that we did touch upon, but I don't know that we've really confronted head on, uh, which is, the relatively cheap and easy kinds of tests that most states use for assessments are ones that are based on you know, pennies per administration, the Scantron bubble tests that we're all very familiar with, and those tests are best designed for factual recall. But we're putting teachers in sort of this place, and, and the question's been raised, everything from is it time to give up on those tests and just reinvent a whole new assessment system and move away from it, or are there ways to sort of reconcile um, the way that the assessments are used with the kinds of experiment, uh, experiential learning experiences that you all are advocating for. 
Let me, let me pose a question. What, would um, the AP exams, science and math AP exams, uh, in, you, in your view, meet a, a higher standard of students writing essays, not just filling in bubbles? They're and just like? changing, in they fact. Changing. There's a new biology AP this year. Yeah. There will be a new chemistry AP next year. And they're, they've been looking at the same things we're looking at, and they're saying we're, our courses were too fact-oriented and not enough doing-oriented. They're really changing the kind of test they're going to have. We haven't yet seen the new biology test, so I can't answer how far down the road it's going, but there's definitely a change happening in, in the advanced placement courses. I think the, the other thing to remember is, you know, we, we talk a lot about the testing regime in schools. That's in math and language arts. Mm -hmm. And it needs to change, I would, would agree, but in science, we're only testing three times in California, I think it's fourth grade, eighth grade, and 10th grade. So to say we're all driven by the testing doesn't quite make sense. However, I do think it's really, really important. We have to think, measurement does drive what happens in the classroom. If we're gonna hold the teacher accountable by a certain test, then of course the teacher will teach to that test. So we need to make the test one that's worth teaching to. And measuring, my, my, my way of saying this is measure what matters, not what's easy to measure. We've been too driven by what we can easily and cheaply measure, and we have to get beyond that. Because it's actually damaging learning to focus on measuring the wrong things. Because then the teachers spend all the time training students to meet those measures. And it's not the kind of learning we've been talking about here. The um, question has come up that uh, a number of students have uh, learning disabilities, perhaps as many as 20%, uh, and that uh, the, the hypothesis has been out there for quite a while that experiential learning better serves not just these students, but all students. Do you know of any sort of evidence or studies that really backs up that, in fact, uh, learning by doing an experiential learning really does serve more of our student body than is currently being uh, well served by the system. I'll give two quick examples. Um, there are a bunch of donors on our site who shy away from ever funding a project seeking a, a touchscreen tablet, who would never touch an, a request for iPads because it might feel frivolous. And to these donors, we, we encourage them to take a look at the iPad requests on our site from special education teachers, because in the hands of a student with autism with, with a range of other disabilities, a, a touchscreen tablet can be transformative, can enable them to communicate in ways they never could before, can engage them in learning in ways that are, are, would be impossible without that device. The other um, kind of project that we're seeing a, a small trend in, I took a look and, and I saw 35 of these projects just a few days ago and it, it shows you the, the range of, of interventions available, is um, special education teachers requesting resources that hinge on therapy dogs. And what, what's that about? It's that teachers discovered, have discovered that uh, special needs students, many of whom are very apprehensive about reading out loud in front of the classroom, they're afraid of being made fun of, uh, they're self-conscious about their ability to read out loud, and they therefore say that they hate reading. If you put a book in that student's hand, and in many special needs classrooms there's a therapy dog that's serving a particular student, if you ask that student who says that they hate reading to read to the therapy dog, the therapy dog is this completely attentive, non-judgmental audience. <laughs> and teachers have, to, there are all these requests on our site for books that students are to read to therapy dogs uh, because it, it's transformative for a student who claims to, to hate reading, but when they find this non-judgmental audience, all they want to do is read out loud to that therapy dog. <laughs> and the, the other piece is one of the things we have problems with is the tendency of young children to want to move around. And school is not designed for children to want to move around, but particularly little boys have a tendency to want to move around. In an experiential learning situation, this is not a bad thing, right? It's no longer evil if you move around to the other side to look at it better. And so the, the whole culture of the classroom changes 
when the dynamic is not everybody sitting at the desk and being quiet and listening to one person tell them what they should be thinking. So I think it's, it's a very different place, school, when done the way we're talking about here. And it's a place which is more appropriate for more kids. And we can't allow it to become an excuse for low expectations. And I, I say that I was in a school district, 25,000 students, just under 30% of our students uh, were labeled or had disabilities. But, but less than 10% had cognitive disabilities. And we categorize students in a, in a similar fashion. Yet, what we, what we know about those students is they can do, they can learn. They can learn. And they can do high level work if we have expectations to put the right supports in place for them to be successful. And that, that's a critical piece. And I, I was with a, a leader of a national organization around teachers and I w what I was told was that we could penetrate at a higher level with our program if we would make it just a little bit easier. And I think th it's that, that lowering of expectations for any child I is an injustice for them. But we have to build supports in place, whether it's mathematic competency or other supports necessary for them to be successful. And I think students with disabilities deserve that same opportunity. I have another question here, which I just absolutely love. How do we create the fearless teacher? <laughs> I, I actually have met quite a few, <laughs> but I'm not quite sure how you, how you create them. I do think the teacher having the kind of learning experience we're talking about for the student, not only in their schooling, but in their training as a teacher, in the science courses they're taking at the university. If I want a teacher to be engaging the children in modeling the system that they're studying and arguing from evidence about that system, the teacher needs to have experienced that. So giving the teacher the right learning experiences is as critical as giving the kids the right learning experiences. Yeah. I want to come back to another question that Vince sort of raised and touched back on it, the, the out of school time. Uh, sort of two observations, you know, one, of course, is this remarkable maker movement that's exploded here in the Bay Area and now is an international movement where we have 180,000 people show up on a weekend in May in San Mateo to basically see all these incredible projects that kids and adults have built out of their garages and workshops, sort of that remembering the, the hands. And it reminds me, you know, how much we've in the last 30 years in schools pulled shop and home economics and a lot of those courses right out of the curriculum, especially here in California, interestingly. And also uh, really watching the explosion of the after school movement, especially in the elementary grades where the no child left behind, especially in distressed uh, schools, has really pushed almost any science um, less to the average actually in the Bay Area is 15 minutes a day. If that's the average, you can guess which schools are getting any science at all and which ones aren't. Uh, what is the potential of the out of school hours for bringing forward experiential uh, opportunities for every child and what could we be doing more to help really take advantage of all the waking hours? Boys and Girls Clubs are doing a lot with after school in the underserved neighborhoods and, and th realizing that bringing science learning is a way to support also math and language arts learning. So there are many, many places where this can happen. It's a matter of spaces and, and support for those spaces to be open and available. And then the kinds of equipment that your teachers are, are looking for. I, I think we have to, to fuzz the line between in school and out of school because why should we say, well, we're going to do school in school and we're going to do play out of school. We should be doing some of each in each. Yeah. <laughs> great, great answer, Helen. I, uh, unfortunately, we've reached the point in our program where there's time for only one more question. Uh, and so I want to sort of turn it over to the perspective of our listeners. Um, if I wanted to contribute somehow myself uh, to seeing more of these experiences out there available and wanted to be involved meaningfully, what is it that I could do? Um, I'd like to hear from each of our panelists one final time. Who wants that first? Well, I'll give uh, two opportunities. One is a crass ask for money, uh, but the, <laughs> the good news is that you can give as little as one dollar 
to a classroom project on Donors Choose Again, you get photographs of your project in action, a thank you note from the teacher, an <laughs> impact letter that the teacher writes describing the learning that's taking place. You can see a cost report showing how every penny was spent. With one dollar, you can feel like Bill Gates making a million dollar gift. And you can search for science and math, hands-on projects in the town where you grew up, or matching a topic that you're passionate about, and, and really find something, a, a project that matches your passion, and not just consummate a donation, but forge a relationship with the classroom you choose to help. The donor and the teacher can message back and forth with each other. Uh, the the um, ask for your time and talent is to let you know that we've opened up to the public all the data generated by a quarter million teachers posting 400,000 classroom project requests on DonorsChoose.org. And the data covers everything from uh, uh, the teacher, are they a Teach for America core member, what grade level do they teach in, information about the school, its poverty rate, its latitude and longitude, whether it's a charter school or not, a year-round school, information about the project, every material that the teacher is requesting down to the book ISBN number and the book title, the essay that the teacher has written which can be mined for recurring words. And you don't need to be a programmer to rock out on this data. You do need to know how to operate a spreadsheet, but that's about it. And if any of you want to look at the hands-on projects that teachers are posting in your community uh, to draw out interesting discoveries, which might show you what's trending in the minds of local teachers, what resources are most needed in your community, which you might want to let your elected officials know about, this is an opportunity to, to have fun with big data in ways that have real world local implications. While we raise money, we are, are real clear that we want resources going to classrooms. In fact, we are, are putting together and putting in place a business model that will allow 100% of the resources we generate from organizations to go directly to schools and help schools implement our program. I think that's one key piece. But in terms of getting involved, we have three areas, what we call our three pillars in Project We The Way. One, providing world-class curriculum, high-quality professional development teacher training, and the third is having an engaged network. So I, I want to make a clear distinction and giving money and giving of time. And it's very important that we find ways to engage with students. Students need role models. They need to see people who are doing these things. Mm -hmm. That's part of the entire experience. They can do things in classrooms, but for organizations and companies, and I mentioned the, the enormous effect Chevron's having on thousands of students of getting into classrooms and talking with students, allowing your people, your, your employees to get into schools and engage with students is, is an incredible way to, to get involved. And sitting down with, with building principals or going to school districts and just asking a question, how can we help? What can we do? How can we support your work? I think will go a long way in helping us um, continue to expand this type of learning for students. Yeah. Thank you, Vince. Helen? I think there's a, an entirely different level of getting involved, and that's getting involved with your political voice, right? If you think that the kinds of testing that we're doing is not good, then your elected representatives need to know that. So thank you to our panelists. Uh, Charles Best, founder of DonorChoose.org. Uh, uh, Dr. Vince uh, Bertram, President and CEO of Project Lead the Way, and Dr. Helen Quinn, uh, Emerita Professor of Physics at Stanford University. Uh, we also want to thank our audiences, both here and on the radio, television, and the internet. Uh, and in particular, I really do appreciate the vigorous questions that you were sending up to me, and I hope that I did justice to at least some of um, what you wanted to hear today, tonight. Um, this program has been a part of the Commonwealth Club's California Innovation Series, underwritten by Chevron Corporation. I'm Dennis Bartels, and now, this meeting of the Commonwealth Club of California, the place to be known and to know, <laughs> is adjourned. Good job. Hey, thank you so much.